cooperation, if that's okay. Great. I need you to form two groups, approximately equal numbers, which means that you need to be able to count and you need to be able to move. So, <laughs> so I would recommend that you try and get together with those that have a more difficult time moving, so they don't have to. Okay, you got one more on the list? Oh yeah, I got one. What was the 
the world owed. We deserve this, right? Yeah. This is our due. Yeah. Okay, so now, I know that you got a few more on your list. That's okay. We're not going to go through all of them. The question comes in, how has the world fulfilled these promises? <laughs> okay. Does the world ever really... No, they're still trying. They're trying. Yeah, so they, they don't really make do with the promise. They make a promise, and they can't keep it. Because they don't have any resource, the power to actually do that. Money will make you happy. Yes, so what? Have you guys seen my pocket? <laughs> <laughs> that was the same summer. Yeah. So they say money will make you but they don't ever bother to give you any. Right? Well, I guess that's where they say you play the lottery and you'll be happy if you win. Yeah, that hasn't worked either. So. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to make a switch. Those of you who were scribes, you get to pick the next scribe. So go ahead and pass your paper on to someone. <laughs> All right. So now in your groups, what I want you to do is I want you to make a list of promises that God makes. So you got two minutes. Go ahead and make up. Make a list of promises that God makes. All right. So since this group started last time, we're going to start with this group over here. Oh, no, you're done. <laughs> oh, okay. So give, give me one from your list. What does God promise? Um, the time of salvation. Salvation. You like that one. Okay, God promise salvation. What, what else?
So, Second Peter, chapter two. Um, I'm going to start with verse one, but primarily we're going to look at verse four. But Second Peter, chapter one, beginning in verse one, it says, "Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ." to those who obtain like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord, and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by, by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, so that through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, verses 3 and 4 are quite lengthy, but what we're going to focus on is verse 4. God's promises are described two major adjectives, and what are they? So, great and precious promises. So, just to give you an idea of what we're dealing with here, the Greek word for great, and, uh, yeah, great is a word that you're probably familiar with because we use it all the time. Little children play with mega blocks. And now, for churches, we have mega churches. And we have mega buildings. And we have mega millions, if you win the lottery. Um, the Greek word mega just is large. It's large. We're familiar with that. That's the word that's used here. God's, God's promises are, are mega. They're, they're huge. They're, they're not dinky little things. God's promises are huge promises. The other one, precious. Anybody here wearing jewelry? I'm assuming some of the mothers. Yeah, okay. Anybody wearing real, real, real jewelry? Yeah, okay. So maybe that's, that there are some diamond rings floating around somewhere. Yeah. Well, the idea behind the precious is the same thing that we would attach to the idea of precious jewels. That they are of great value. There's great worth and there's great meaning behind them. So, okay, so we got large precious promises. Well, no, there is no. When, when Scripture talks about God's promises, it's because there is meaning attached to this. Now, and this is what I want you to see here in 2 Peter, verse 4. He's giving us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Anybody here ever heard of the term sanctification? Okay, what is the idea of sanctification? Okay, there's a cleansing involved. Set apart. Being set apart from what? A two what? Sin and the world of righteousness. Yeah, so we're set apart from the sin and the world, and we're set apart unto God for righteousness, holiness. So we've got a cleansing that goes on, we've got a separation that goes on. And in that, the idea is that we would become more and more like God, that we would be more holy. In fact, the word sanctification actually comes from the same word from which we get the word, holy. The idea is that we were being made more holy. And now here, according to Peter, he says that these promises have been given to us so that we can become partakers of the divine nature. Really? Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Now, Romans chapter 8 is pretty easy to find. It's right after Romans chapter 7. <laughs> you get used to me. I'm always so helpful like this. There is a wonderful promise in Romans chapter 8 that many, many, many believers know and cling to. And it's found in verse 28. Would somebody be so kind as to read that? Well, the, the 
than what it says right here? We know that all things work to you. Really? Okay, okay. So now, now we've got some qualifiers with this. All things work together for good if you meet the other qualifications. So this is what you would call a conditional promise. The first part is only true if the second part is met. So all things work together for good for who? Those who love God. For those who love God. That are called according love God, called according to his purpose. Okay. How do you get called according to his purpose? And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then when you call upon the name of the Lord for salvation, you find out according to Ephesians chapter 1 that the Lord had already called you from before the foundation of the world. So you find out that you're called according to his purpose. Okay? So now we've got that part. If you're saved, you fit the, the called part now about the loving God. Loving God. I'm not going to ask if you want to go. I get to say that for a sermon. <laughs> but, if you were to turn to Romans chapter 5, hold your finger here in Romans chapter 8, and turn back just a couple pages to Romans chapter 5. <laughs> anyway, um, Romans chapter 5, if you look at verse 5, Maybe, maybe nah, let's back up to verse 1 so you get the whole idea of what's going on. Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith. Okay, we're talking about believers, right? Those who have been declared righteous by God's own appointment through faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God for our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we... We have access by faith in the grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because, this is the part that I want you to hear. Hope doesn't disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So, if you were to couple this, when you call upon the name of the Lord, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, in that, the love of God has been poured out into your heart by the Holy Spirit that has been given to us, so that Romans 8.28 applies to all believers. All, because the love of God has been poured into your heart, you've been called according to His purpose. So, all believers technically fit the qualifications for Romans 8.28. So, let's go back to the beginning of Romans 8.28. For a believer in Jesus Christ, do all things work together for good? Okay. So what, do you, what do you say to a guy who's he, he's really working on the idea of serving the Lord and wants to serve the Lord but he gets in an accident and, and he kills a guy and he leaves the wife a widow and a two year old daughter fatherless did everything work together for good for for that believer that was driving the vehicle that killed this guy? Yes. It's not over yet. Yeah. It needs a longer view. It's working together. And, and that's where some of our problem lies, that all too often we have our focus right on one event and we miss the big picture. Because if you were to look back at Romans chapter 5, we didn't cover all of this because that wasn't the idea, but in Romans chapter 5, we went through this list wonderful things. Uh, verse 3 of Romans chapter 5, and not only that, but we glory. Okay, okay let's try this again. I want to make sure I read this right. Not only that, but we, we also glory in tribulation. Nah, that can't, that can't be right. Does your Bible read that way? Yeah. Come on. We glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Or hope doesn't make us ashamed. Paul goes so far as saying that we glory in our tribulation. You know, if you were to take Romans chapter 5 
first, before you get to Romans chapter 8, 28, it would make sense. All things work together for good, including our tribulation, because we rejoice in tribulation, because tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope, and hope does not make us ashamed. So we know that all things work together for good, if for no other reason than this simple reason. God said so. God promised. Does God ever lie? No. No, no he can't lie. It's impossible for God to lie. So he can't lie. He made the promise that all things would work together for good. But sometimes we don't see that in the here and now. We, we don't see that when we're sitting on the side of the road, waiting for the police and the ambulance and everybody to show up after you just hit a guy with a vehicle and killed him dead. I know. I'm that guy. I was there. But does God work all things for good? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. I know you couldn't hear me that. Yeah. <laughs> rattle, rattle, rattle. It, it doesn't matter what the circumstances look like. So let's say that you've got a guy who professes faith in Christ and he goes around and he preaches the good news of Jesus and winds up getting locked up and then tortured for his faith. Is everything working together for good? Yes. Yeah. Do we see it? Not necessarily always, but you take somebody like the Apostle Paul, that very thing happened to him, and as a result, he had the opportunity to share the gospel with the entire Roman household. I mean, how else do you get an opportunity like that? Uh, all things work together for good. Okay, now this is where we're going to go a little bit farther. I, I will get back to 2 Peter eventually. do this in 12 minutes. So, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. That purpose is clearly defined in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. So, the very next verse, which says, For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. God's ultimate purpose is that you would be conformed to the image of His Son. He wants to make you like Jesus. Not necessarily in a physical standpoint, because obviously we don't all look alike. We're not all going to look alike. But, from the other standpoint, of in character, in righteousness, in holiness, which is according to Ephesians, how we're supposed to be made after the image of our God, uh, we're going to be conformed to the image of Christ. How, how do we do that? How do we, how do we help that process along? Well, that's where you turn back to 2 Peter chapter 1. See, if you had your finger there, you can know it. So in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says he's given us exceedingly great and precious promises so that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Which is just another way of saying that God will conform you to the image of His Son. He wants to make you like Jesus. He wants to give you the divine nature. Well, how is He going to do that in this life and the here and now? Because most of the time we think, oh, that, that pertains to the hereafter. When many, many years from now, when I'm old and dead and I've gone home to be with the Lord, then I'll be like Jesus. That's true. But why wait? Wouldn't you love to be more like Jesus now? I mean, isn't that God's goal for us? That here on earth, that we would walk like Jesus. Anyone who says that he believes in him must walk as he walked. First John, by the way. Um, so the idea is that we would become like Christ. The way to do that, to help that along, is through the promises. That's what it says here. He's given us these great and precious promises so that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. You believe a promise, you take the promise, you live the promise, you become more like Jesus. I'll give you an illustration. I want you to list for me those times in which Jesus did not believe his father. 
Very good. So that didn't take long at all, did it? So did Jesus believe the Father all the time? Yeah. You read this verse, you can, you can find it in Romans 117, but you can read it in other places throughout Scripture. The just will live by faith. The just will live by faith. We're saved by grace through faith, and we continue to live by faith. The idea is not for us to do what it is that we think is best to be done because God is a king. No. We do what we believe that God wants us to do. We live by faith. Obedience is an aspect of that. God said that we should do this, and so we do it because we believe, we trust, we have faith in what God said, and so we obey. In fact, if you were to look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But with faith, that means that we do please God, to just live by faith. One of the practical applications of that is actually taking a promise that God has given and believing it. Holding Him to it. Seeing that work out in life. I mean, imagine what life would be like if throughout the day you knew exactly what God had promised you and you actually believed that as you went through the day. Take, for example, one of the most often repeated promises in Scripture, and it's worded a little differently in different ways, which was mentioned by this group over here. I will never leave you nor forsake you. But it's worded different ways, like, I'll be with you. So, like, you take Moses as a prime example. Moses, God's going to try and get him to go back to Israel, sorry, back to Egypt, to deliver the Israelites from Egypt. And Moses is like, who am I? I that I should be able to do this. And God's promise to him was, I will be with you. God's promise to Joshua, leading the children of Israel in the promised land, is, I will be with you. How do you know that David was on the Lord's side and he was fighting the battles of the Lord? Because it said that the Lord was with him. The greatest promise of all is that God promised to be with us. But then you've got so many other promises. Take, for example, uh, promises that you've already mentioned for eternal life, salvation, home. Um, I can't remember them all. Did God promise to provide for our needs? Okay, so God promised to provide for our needs, we need to worry about it. No. Okay, so has God promised to bring to completion the work that He's begun in us? Yes. Yeah. If I was really mean, I'd go, so where is that from? But, uh, it's Philippians 1 6. But the idea is God's promise to break the completion of the work that He's begun. So, anybody here? I probably shouldn't ask for a show of hands, but I will. Anybody here, since you've made a profession of faith in Christ, ever sinned? <laughs> you know, there's a great promise for that. If we confess our sins, they formed us to both forgive us our sins because we're wrong. Yeah. See? And that is part of the process of actually working us through to bring to completion the very thing that he's actually begun. God's promised all of this stuff. So, here's, here's one of the things I'm going to encourage you to do is to find the promises of God and claim them. I highly encourage you to write them down and memorize them. Take them with you. Um, I, I keep a list with me that you're never going to be able to read from back there unless you have a magnified glass. You probably aren't going to be able to read it from up here. Um, I originally started in the New Testament. Where I know it's in here somewhere. So I started with Matthew and started writing down every promise that I could find. And so front, front and back on, on these sheets of paper, I, I have promises that, that God has made to us. Imagine what life would be like if, if we actually believed these promises that God made us and, and then lived that. Just because I'm going to show you a secondary thing. Not, not only is God's promises good for making us like Christ, second, you know, Peter says there's another reason for it. And if you'll turn there in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says, So that you may be partakers of the divine nature, 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust or through desire, depending on what your translation is. The implication behind that is that through faith in Christ, we have already escaped and we are still escaping the corruption that is in the world. But if you were to go back, it's through the promises that you are being partakers of the divine nature and escaping the corruption. You want to escape corruption? Find a promise. Hold to it. Believe it. Claim it. Hold God to it. it it's a great thing to see God work and keep His word because can God lie? Okay, let's not say all the ones. <laughs> Can God lie? No. No. It's impossible. In fact, it's a promise. And that's where we're going to end by turning to Hebrews chapter 6. Starting in verse 17. God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. Uh, you, you notice that? The heirs of promise. That, that's a key point there. Okay, so God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. To lay hold of the hope set. So, for those of us who are heirs of promise, this, by the way, I know there is one major promise that, that God has promised. That promise comes with all kinds of multiple little promises that go along with it. So God, wishing to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability Great word of his counsel. What what does immutability mean? Can't change, never change. Yep, can't change, won't change, never will change. So God wanted to show the unchangeableness of his counsel has confirmed it with an oath. <laughs> I love it. As if it wasn't good enough for God to actually make a promise, he confirms the promise with an oath. Is God ever going to leave us or forsake us? Is God ever going to turn his back on us? Is God always going to work everything out for good? Is God always going to have our best in mind? And is God always going to make us more like Christ through that process? What do we have to worry about? We've got all these promises. All we got to do, believe it. Use it. See God do amazing things. Right. Well, let's close in prayer. Ah, Father, you have promised incredible things to us through Christ. Well, you have sworn an oath to keep your promises. Lord, we are grateful. And encourage us with your word. Encourage us to seek and to find to ask, to knock, uh, that the door would be open for us to, to behold your wonderful promises and to claim them, to cling to them, and to see you work on us. Lord, we ask that you would do this not, not for us, but for your own name's sake, for your great name, that it would be held in honor and esteemed by us because we believe you, and that others would give you glory and praise because of how you work.